Here we go. Going to share screen. And here we go. So again, this is going over a lot of this stuff from cellular respiration again, which is, I will totally admit is kind of complicated. There's a lot of stuff going on. It usually takes a little while to really get it solid. Your book, chapter four, has some nice um, figures and talks about the different things. So there's places to review that your notes, as well as the book, as well as I'm sure there's this is such a core part of biology. There's lots of different resources out there. Um, so cytochromes, the electron transport system. Again, most people got this. You know, it's what's making that proton gradient, which is going to be necessary to build to make the ATP. You know, it definitely does not produce NADH. In fact, it is taking the NA, the electrons from NADH as NADH um, splits. So it's accepting electrons from NADH, but it's definitely not producing NADH. How many net ATP molecules glycolysis? So glycolysis is just those first 10 steps that are happening in the cytosol without oxygen. And there you're only getting two net ATP, right? You only get the 36 if you go through that whole big rigmarole inside the mitochondria, with the Krebs cycle and the electron transport system and pumping the protons and the protons coming back down through that ATP synthase. Which of the following is not an intermediate? So this one, um, we have to remember what an intermediate is. It's just a molecule made along the way during a metabolic pathway. Um, you know, pyruvate we know is an intermediate. That's the end, that's one of the compounds at the end of glycolysis. And then pyruvate's transformed into acetyl-CoA, another intermediate which is entering into the Krebs cycle. And after acetyl-CoA is combining with the oxaloacetate, it's making citric acid. That's why we call it the citric acid cycle as well. That's the beginning of the Krebs cycle. So all of those are intermediates. Those are molecules that are made along the pathway. You know, hexokinase. In fact, anything with an ACE after it is, that's a giveaway that it is a enzyme. And we've talked about kinases since like the first week of class. Kinases. What, what in general, as a class, what do does a kinase do? It's a catalyst. It's a catalyst that does what? If you're a kinase. Phosphorylation. If phosphorylation. So this one is phosphorylating the sugar. We're going to see creatine kinase when we get into muscle metabolism, phosphorylating creatine. Um, we're going to see protein kinase A in a little bit later this morning, looking at signal transduction, phosphorylating proteins inside the cells. So whenever you see the word kinase, you're like, zing, enzyme, and particularly an enzyme that is involved in phosphorylating things. Um, and then this last one, this is going to be important today. We've mentioned this before. I wanted to make sure you kind of remembered this. Concentration of sodium inside the cell is always going to be lower because we're pumping sodium out. That Na, that sodium potassium pump. Concentration of potassium, on the other hand, is going to be higher inside because you're pumping potassium inside. This is going to be a key when we start talking about the um, electrical signaling in cells um, in a few moments. And Chloride is lower inside. So when you open up the chloride channel, the chloride comes in, which is going to make things more negative as we get add more negative in there. That's going to be a way we can lower the uh, membrane voltage on a cell is open chloride channels. And as the chloride enters, the voltage is going to get even lower inside because there's more negative charge near the inside membrane. So, um, this one. Um, 50-50, this is, some pe people got to brush up on this. 
The cell requires oxygen in order to produce ATP from glucose. Is this true or false? False, it's anaerobic. Yeah, it's totally false, right? We can, the whole point of anaerobic cellular respiration, making those two ATP. Oh. You know, remember you can make ATP. It's not as efficient. You only get two ATP instead of 36, but you do get ATP and it is going to be useful if we get into the muscle metabolism. You know, your fast switch fibers totally rely on this to make ATP um, without oxygen. It just it makes it makes it really fast. We'll see. Um, so just in remembering, if you want to go the whole hog and do the all the steps in the mitochondria, then you need oxygen, but the first steps that have the two net ATP don't need oxygen at all. That's where I got confused. I thought it was for the whole thing for some reason. Yeah, no, just making ATP from, uh, from glucose, you can, and, and we're gonna see later in more, when we get into it in more detail, if you do use these anaerobic pathways, you're gonna have to use extra oxygen to recover, to um, kind of reset everything. So in some ways, you know, we're going to talk about this in, you know, explicitly, this idea of oxygen debt. If you're using these anaerobic pathways, you ultimately are going to need extra oxygen later on in order to bring things back to your baseline. But in the moment, you don't need oxygen to make ATP from glucose. It's just you only get two per glucose instead of 36. So we should have thought about, we should have considered anaerobic, right? For that question? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I didn't think about it. Yeah, anaerobic, uh, anaerobic respiration is important. Okie dokie. Um, any other kind of questions, clarifications for about all the stuff we did last, last class? The whole cellular respiration. No? Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we are gonna look at another thing in the cell and we're gonna look in more detail. Um, and again, just like cellular respiration, this is another one of these basic functions that cells are doing that you should understand at a deeper level in order to kind of put things together later on as we look at cells as parts of tissues and organs and stuff. But what we're going to do now is this idea of signal transduction. Gosh, hold on. This is like... Let me, I'll do it all pretty. The signal transduction. This is basically this idea we were talking about with receptors. Right, we talked about you have some cell and there's some kind of receptor. You know, and then we talked about some ligand. It binds the receptor. Yeah, and something happens. So this is my signal. My signal is you have some ligand, some signaling molecule is coming in. It's binding some kind of receptor, but then something happens. Maybe a channel opens, or maybe you're turning on some enzymes to free up glucose into your bloodstream, or maybe you're turning on cellular processes, turning on cell division, or who knows what. But the basic idea here is there's some signal that's telling the cell what to do, but then we need some process that connects 
this binding event to some actual action in the cell. So transduction means kind of like translation. Like how do we actually bridge that gap from a ligand binding a receptor, you know, and then it's like, you know, we could just say like hand waving and then all this stuff can happen. Channels can open or enzymes can get turned on. But what we're gonna do now is look at that process in more detail. And that actually is important. I'm looking at there's two different, there's a couple of different ways this can happen. And there's a lot of different players in the processes. And those different um, pro players in the process of signal transduction are often the targets for drugs. So if you're trying to understand drug mechanisms, you actually have to understand more detailed um, steps of what exactly is going on in signal transduction, particularly in these, we're gonna talk about second messenger mediated pathways. So let's do this. But the basic idea of signal transduction is there's some signal, some ligand is binding some kind of a receptor and then something happens and how does that, does that happen? So I'll start with the simple the simplest um, version of how this works. So example, um, ligand gated channels that are direct okay so Let's say here's your cell. So the basic idea here is there is a ligand that controls this thing. In this case, the ligand is this neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. Most people have heard of acetylcholine. Um, acetylcholine is also um, abbreviated as ACH usually. Oh, I'm gonna draw it prettier. So acetylcholine comes in there is a spot on this. This is a big membrane protein. There's a spot that fits it just right where it binds. And it directly controls the gate on this big protein. So Binds and directly opens the gate. So basically, this is a just this big, imagine it's this big mechanical system. As soon as the acetylcholine pops into its pr proper slot, it ends up opening the gate. And then once the gate is open, you know, my cations, usually it's like sodium is going to start rushing in. So this is an example of like a directly controlled um, channel here, this ligand gated channel. And there's no, um, 
there's no extra steps involved. It's basically as soon as this thing docks in there, there is some mechanical connection that opens the channel and lets the sodium in through the channel. Um, and there's no um, flexibility here, right? It's either you have acetylcholine in the slot and the thing is open or acetylcholine is not there and it's closed. So does this, does this make sense? Like a directly gated channel here? So this is, these are, these are important. We're gonna see a number of these that are important, but they're not necessarily the most common way. The most common way you control channels using ligands is much more indirect. Um, so, but I just wanna make sure you realize that sometimes things are directly controlled. Like, and again, when we talk about diff cholinergic, I should mention this word, if we'll be seeing it more and more. This is just an adjective, adjective related to acetylcholine. Right, cholinergic related to acetylcholine. So, and a nicotinic cholinergic receptor is just a subtype of, of, of receptor, um, I should call it, you know, this is a receptor. Um, we're also going to see muscarinic cholinergic receptors that are actually binding acetylcholine as well, but act differently. Um, nicotinic just gets its name because in the lab, if you're trying to distinguish this particular class of cholinergic receptor, um, what do you think they're going to bind? Nicotine? Nicotine, exactly. In fact, it's, you know, why, you know, this is an Apple pencil, but it looks like a cigarette. Yeah. If I'm drinking like a drag off of a cigarette, you know, why does it like kind of wake me up and focus me? You know, it's because those nicotine molecules are getting into my brain and binding nicotinic cholinergic receptors and opening sodium channels and you know, changing my overall like level of attention and stuff in my brain. So again, nicotine is just another exogenous ligand um, that can bind to these receptors. Um, and that's how we get, we distinguish them by their, we name them because they bind nicotine, whereas some of the other cholinergic receptors do not. So anyway. So now I'm going to talk about a single. I'm going to type it again so it's pretty. Okay, signal transduction using second messengers and mediated by G proteins. So this is more common and a lot more complicated. So let me let me kind of introduce a few of the kind of ideas here. So first, let's talk about typical second messengers. And we'll talk about more exactly what a second messenger is and the, what they're doing in a few seconds. But first, let me just give you an example of some of the molecules that play a role as second messengers. Um, and they're basically gonna be part of this pathways that is going to translate the message. Very common is cyclic AMP. 
you know, I've, I've introduced this to you when we talked about nucleotides, um, you know, a few weeks ago. It's basically adenosine monophosphate kind of hooked up in like a ring. And it's going to play an important role as a signaling molecule. These are basically signaling molecules within the cell. Um, another one that's um, we're going to see is cyclic GMP. Right, it's the same basic deal, except instead of an adenosine, it's a guanosine. Right, yeah, it's just the the G nucleotide base. Um, and then another one, which actually is, is just calcium. Calcium is a very common second messenger. Normally, calcium is very low inside the cytosol. It gets sequestered and kind of held, held out of action. But then as part of the signaling process, it gets released and does all sorts of stuff inside the cell. So calcium is also a important second messenger. I have a quick question. Uh-huh. So how are second messengers different from a ligand? Because the definition kind of sounds the same. They're both signaling some change inside the cell. Right, so these are things that are gonna be triggered secondary to the ligand binding the receptor. So what, I'll kind of show you how this works in a moment. These are gonna be, after the ligand binds the receptor, there's gonna be this chain reaction that happens that includes these signaling molecules doing things inside the cell. So they are more kind of like part of the process rather than the thing that's initiating the, the process. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is give you an, and I also have to, G proteins, these are associated with receptors. And they get the name G protein because they bind with GTP, which is another, makes sense. ATP is adenosine triphosphate. This is um, guanosine triphosphate. Um, but in this case, it's not about energy as much as about part of the signaling process and activating things. Um, all right, so now let's put all these, right now I've just given you a bunch of random pieces, but now we're gonna put them together and hopefully make them make sense. Okay, hold on, Tencent, I think. We gotta just mute it. Okay. So one typical example. So there are so many different versions of these second messenger pathways. I'm gonna give you a kind of example of a classic looking kind of one. And then I'll give you, um, I'll tell you all sorts of ways they can vary. So this is my cell membrane. This is outside the cell. This is a cytoplasm in here. Just so you can get a sense of where we're at. Um, let's put the receptor here. Get a ligand involved here. And again, the ligand is going to do some kind of binding here. <clears throat> 
You know, and a little later today, I am going to spend more time talking exactly what binding means. We'll look at it at a molecular level, an atomic level. But for right now, again, let's let it be a little more general. Binding, it fits in like a lock and a key. Um, so this is my receptor here. And now, instead of having this kind of directly gated kind of thing, like I showed you in the previous example, where the ligand binds the receptor and something happens directly, this is going to be very indirect. There's going to be lots of steps involved. So, and it's going to be initiated by this, we call it G protein. So the G protein is associated with the receptor. It hangs out, it's docked to it. Um, there are three subunits to a, to a G protein. Um, don't worry about the details of it. Um, but basically it gets its name because once the ligand binds the receptor, um, the G protein is going to actually bind GTP and get activated, at least the alpha, one of the subunits, and we'll continue on and do some more stuff. So let us look at how this works. Um, I need to add in some more pieces into this. I'm going to add another an enzyme here. Remember we said Membrane proteins can be enzymes as well as receptors and things. So this is going to be an enzyme. And again, this is one particular example. There are other examples of other second messenger pathways, but this is a common one where we have a membrane protein that is an enzyme known as adenylyl cyclase. So this um, catalyzes the formation of cyclic AMP. So this enzyme in the membrane here, if it's turned on, is going to start synthesizing cyclic AMP. But right now it's just sitting here quiet. All right, so I think we're set to start our story here. So first thing that's gonna happen is the ligand binds the receptor. That is going to we're gonna talk about this in more detail. That is gonna cause a weird wiggle in this receptor that activates the G protein. So when the ligand binds the receptor, this is gonna activate the G protein. The G protein is then gonna break free, at least the alpha subunit is gonna break free and gonna start drifting through the membrane. And I'm gonna put a little star by it because it's active now. And ultimately my little activated G protein, I say G sub alpha because it's like the alpha subunit. Ultimately this G protein I should say activated G protein. So all of a sudden the adenylyl cyclase is turned on. 
thanks to the action of this G protein. What's gonna happen now? What does the tenylylcyclase do? Uh, it's gonna form cyclic AMP. Exactly, exactly. This is gonna turn on and all of a sudden we're gonna start making lots of cyclic AMP in the cell. So cyclic AMP is starting to go up. So here you get a sense of why it's called a second messenger even, right? Our first messenger was the Did ligand. You Could you try again? So the ligand binds here at the receptor. You know, that is the first messenger. At this point Could now, you try again? Good God. at this point we have inside of the cell, we have a messenger that's building up, that's continuing the message inside the cell, right? So that's why it's called the second messenger. It's the second step, another molecule now that is continuing this message that was originally delivered by the ligand binding the receptor. So, and like I said, the second messenger doesn't have to be cyclic AMPs. In some of these pathways, it's cyclic GMP building up. In other pathways, it's calcium building up. I didn't get that. Could you try again? Hold on. I, um, yeah, I have like a new Apple Watch and I still haven't figured out why it's, it shouldn't be talking right now, but it's not gonna, you're not gonna hear it anymore because it's far away now. Um, all right, so cyclic AMP is building up. Now we got, this has got to do something. So again, at this step, what happens next? There's lots of different options, but a typical thing is the cyclic AMP is going to turn on protein kinase A. Um, So five, cyclic AMP activates So this is another step. Again, this is probably feeling familiar from Tuesday. It's like, oh my God, when does it end? Um, what does a kinase do? What would a protein kinase do? Phosphorylate protein? Exactly. This phosphorylates proteins. You know, and phosphorylate, some of the proteins that it might phosphorylate would be a transport protein in the membrane like a channel. So this, by phosphorylating a protein, can like open or close a channel. What other proteins are important in cells that play important roles? What's the major role of proteins in the cell? In metabolism. Um, I was gonna say like, um, 
building chains of amino acids and uh, multiplying? So. Or the other thought I had was integral proteins. So something even more kind of more fundamental, like what, what's necessary for any metabolic pathway to run? Like a catalyst? Yeah. Or enzymes? The enzymes, right? Enzymes are proteins. Enzymes are making all the different chemical reactions go. So a lot of times the target for this protein kinase A is an enzyme. And it might turn enzymes on or off. You know, for instance, if you were in, um, if you were in the, in the liver, the liver cells, which are storing glycogen, they might get a message. The initial ligand might be, um, you know, one of these stress hormones or might be glucagon or might be thyroid, thyroid hormone, things that, you know, are, trying to trigger or trying to increase the amount of available glucose in your bloodstream. So the end of this pathway might be turning on an enzyme that breaks apart glycogen into glucose to free up glucose that is now gonna enter into your bloodstream, right? So it could be the end of this pathway is turn on an enzyme that you know, releases glucose into the bloodstream. Or it could be the end of this pathway is opening or closing some ion channel or something else. It can turn on or off um, things in the nucleus and start like more, um, more elaborate cellular processes. You know, so I'm gonna say, or so much more. So does, is this making sense? We've got the initial binding, you know, so I, I can say six is this, this is six. Once the protein kinase phosphorylates things, it might be opening or closing channels or activating or deactivating enzymes or who knows what else. It can be connected into the cellular machinery in a myriad ways. Um, I should mention once this is going, at some point, the remember I've, I've talked about binding being a temporary thing. At some point, the ligand is gone. The ligand goes away. You want to make sure that we eventually turn off this process. So once we are no longer activating the second messenger pathway, we need to start degrading the second messenger that had built up in the cell. So that's gonna be another important thing that you should pay attention to. Um, there is an enzyme called phosphodiesterase, PDE. Let me, I'm gonna, yeah to make, hold on. Would that be phosphodiesterase would be considered uh, step seven or, or it's gonna be like an extra step to turn off the... Um... It's like an extra step to turn. And, and we'll, we're gonna see it can be controlled by other things. So I'm gonna, I'm getting my typing tool cause this is an important thing. I wanna make sure you know, you have it written pretty. But how do I make a small d like this? So this is important too. Like once you have 
once you have this um, initial like ligand is no longer there, we want to make sure that the, we eventually turn off the message. So that means we have something else which is breaking down the second messenger that's in the cell. So eventually the, um, the thing stops. So Viagra, it's like one of the most popular like pharmaceuticals out there. Viagra, which helps guys um, with, you know, keep erections. People who have erectile dysfunction or want to like have their penis stay erect longer. Um, how does it work? Phosphodiesterase inhibitor. This is PDE. So let's talk about why Viagra helps guys keep their erection. It's a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. If we go back over here, it turns out that the process that results in the vasodilation, the blood engorging the penis and helping the guy get an erection is mediated by a second messenger pathway. Um, in this case, it uses cyclic GMP instead of cyclic AMP, but it's the same basic idea. Um, what is going to be the effect of giving somebody a drug that is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor that gets rid of the phosphodiesterase in their system or in their little cells there? Basically, the activation pathway stay turn, stays turned on. Exactly. Once you turn it on, it stays turned on way longer than it would have normally. Right? Normally, if you activate it, then it kind of turns off on its own. But here, if you get rid of the phosphodiesterase, you turn it on, it stays turned on. Um, it's like, you know, the button is stuck. You know, it's like a spring-loaded button. You push the button, normally you let go of the button, the button pops out. But here you click the button and the button stays in. Um, will giving somebody Viagra, like give them an erection, cause an erection to happen? No, because you'd still need that activation. Yeah, exactly. So. Taking Viagra is not going to give a guy an erection, but what will it do? Make it last longer? Yeah, make it last longer. You know, once it happens, it will make it persist and the guy will be able to stay hard longer because the normal thing that would turn off this thing will, is, no longer, um, is no longer active. So this is just an example, like where I'm saying, you have to understand this signal transduction and G proteins and all that at a deeper level to actually understand some really basic drugs, like how does Viagra help a guy stay hard? Um, we're going to see a lot of other drugs also work by messing around at the level of the second messenger pathways here. Um, so any questions about this whole big picture that I've drawn here? I have a question. So when we were talking about PDE, that's just degrading the secondary messenger. But what happens to the G protein on the adenyl cyclase? 
um, it, it eventually it eventually resets and goes back in docks and gets ready it to go again. Need, like another. Like, there are lots of other moving parts to this that I'm not going to talk about. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's a good question. There's I'm giving you kind of an overview of some of the big pictures of it, but there's 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 lots and lots and lots of other little pieces as well, and lots of varieties. For, different variations on the theme as well. Um, and I, like I said, some of the variations on a theme are instead of turning on adenylocyclase, you end up turning on another enzyme in the membrane that ultimately results in calcium building up in the cell. Um, so other, pro, other, other pathways rely on calcium instead of cyclic AMP. Um, I don't want to go into all of the details of it for at the level of our class. It's mostly important that you get a sense of what they look like in general. And, you know, as you go deeper in your studies, you'll probably learn more and more about different ones. Um, so we could ask, 9 a.m. why go through such a crazy crazy thing to open a channel or turn something on instead of doing this more direct thing? What are the advantages? Maybe that it's more controlled. Good God, hold on. Um, yeah, so there is, there's lots of opportunity for control. Um, you know, I should say complex control even. Um, you know, each of these steps in here is another place where you can go in and kind of change what's happening. In fact, it's not uncommon to have different second messenger pathways influence each other you might have another second messenger pathway that's coming in and is turning phosphodiesterase on or off. And therefore one second messenger pathway is actually influencing whether or not the other second messenger pathway actually is gonna follow through and do what it's trying to do, right? So there's all sorts of ways you can have all these different second messenger pathways all kind of messing each other's business and creating these really complicated control of these processes in the cell. So that's one thing you get here is there's a lot of opportunities for control and kind of complicated control in different pathways actually influencing each other at these secondary steps as you go down into the, into the pathway. So that's good. Professor, uh -huh. I have a question. Sure. Um, so back in our notes, we wrote down that second messengers are CAMP, CGMP, and calcium. Um, mm -hmm. Do we go into how calcium is a second messenger somewhere? Um, like I said, it's instead of activating adenylocyclase, you actually activate another enzyme in the membrane. Um, what is it? IP3? I should double check. I can... Um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, there's this, I, yeah, this, so basically there's many steps that ultimately results in the release of calcium in the cell. Okay, um, so this is just more of a surface level and calcium's. Level. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I would say calcium is another, another pathway with, rather than have you memorize IP3 and yeah. diacylglycerol and calmodulin and blah, blah, blah. I think it's, you wouldn't gain a lot from memorizing the names of, I, I think it's worth memorizing the details of at least one example, one like one, you know, important one, but okay. then realize that this is one out of many. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so lots of opportunity for complex control. What are other advantages of 
using this crazy system. So think, go back to the nicotinic cholinergic receptor back when we were, um, and we talk about signal transduction. If this was just a nicotinic cholinergic receptor, what is going to happen when the ligand, the acetylcholine binds the receptor? The directly gated one that I talked about a little while ago. What happens when a acetylcholine binds the receptor? Sodium floods in. Sodium floods in. That's the only thing that can happen. It's just mechanically linked. Acetylcholine binds, sodium gate opens. That's it. You don't have any flexibility in terms of what actually happens when the ligand binds the receptor. Now compare that to this, right? There are second messenger, um, uh, or I should say G protein mediated acetylcholine receptors, particularly like the muscarinic receptors we're gonna talk about. And they are actually gonna ultimately open ion channels, but it's not gonna be direct. It's gonna be some big crazy thing like this. So think about so this is a weird thing about trying to teach at home and like some mornings there's a lot of crap happening. Um, all right, the steps going from a ligand binding the receptor to the ultimate doing something obviously can be many different um, options along the way. And it might be different, different cells. Like for instance, um, insulin. If insulin binds a receptor on your liver cells that are storing glycogen, you know, it's going to turn on enzymes to, you know, create more glycogen, take up sugar and store it away. If insulin is binding on other cells. It might just be telling them, um, you know, turn on, let's take it up and use it. Or if you have, you know, glucagon is, might be telling some cells to do this, but other cells to do that. So depending on which cell you have this ligand binding, it might end up having a different result in the cell, depending on the cell's role in your body. Right, so you can have the same ligand binding the same receptor, but have a different outcome. Similarly, like talking about, um, you know, if I have a, some cell, there might be some receptor for epinephrine, another receptor for glucagon, another receptor for thyroid hormone. But ultimately, all of them are going to turn on some enzyme, you know, to release you know, release glucose into the bloodstream, break apart glycogen and release. So you can have a bunch of different receptors that all ultimately turn on the same thing, do the same thing, right? So you can have either same receptors having different outcomes or similar receptors having the same outcome. It all depends how you connect up the second messenger pathways in here. So when we're talking about advantages here, Another big advantage is you get a lot of flexibility. Again, I'm let me use my type tool so it's not so ugly here. You know, same receptor can result in different outcomes as opposed to that nicotinic receptor, there was no flexibility. It was like, 
You bind it, you open up a sodium channel. But with a second messenger system, when we talk about muscarinic cholinergic receptors, the sky's the limit. When the muscarinic cholinergic receptor binds acetylcholine, I can't tell you what's going to happen unless you're telling me exactly which cell we're looking at. And so we know what particular, what the second messenger pathway looks in that situation. Um, you can have different receptors. Can all result in the same outcome. You know, like I said, in this example of kind of mobilizing sugar in your body, there are lots of different hormones that all tell your cells we need more energy, like cortisol or epinephrine or glucagon or thyroxin. You know, all of those can ultimately turn on the same ultimate result in the cell, even though it started with a different primary um, you know, message, a different ligand binding, a different kind of receptor on the surface of the cell. But ultimately, through the second messenger pathways, they all doing the same thing. So does that, that make sense? Flexibility. Um, and then the last piece, We're talking about advantages. So lots of opportunity for complex control. There's flexibility. And the other part, if you kind of go back into this picture where we started, there's one instance of a ligand binding receptor, but the G protein can go and turn on adenylocyclase. We're making lots of adenylocyclase, lots of cyclic AMP, which is turning on lots of protein kinases A, which are phosphorylating lots of different enzymes or channels. So each step, you start amplifying the result, right? There was only an initial one thing that happened here but ultimately, we've got lots of enzymes all getting turned on and doing stuff in the cell. So there is a lot of amplification of the original signal. Um, I have some little factoid here. Um, yeah, I have here one molecule of epinephrine, adrenaline, binding a receptor on a liver cell can mobilize the release of 100 million molecules of glucose, right? So you've got like this crazy amount of amplification that can happen because each step kind of activates even more of the next step. So it's a way to have a small signal have a big result ultimately. So that, that makes sense? So there's, you can see, even though the second messenger signaling is, is complicated, it's got a lot of advantages. All right, are there any questions about this up to now? Um, a little later, what I am going to do is spend a little more time focusing in right here. Like what happens when a ligand binds the receptor? What does it actually mean? And how does that actually activate the G protein and start this whole process? So I do want you to get a little bit more of a sense. So we'll go a little deeper into this. But for right now, this is kind of a nice place to start thinking about second messenger pathways, G proteins. Um, and again, like I said, you know, it's kind of like cellular respiration. You think like, oh, it should be simpler, but it's not. <laughs> Lots of steps. And each step can actually 
have lots of different options. Um, all right, so let us continue then. Moving on. All right, so the last stuff that we are gonna talk about that is gonna be part of your first exam. Because remember, so, and I, I wrote the announcement so everybody knows exam one is not this coming Tuesday, it's Tuesday a week from now. Um, the material that I wanted to cover is everything we've done up to now, as well as the basic electrical um, behavior of cells. So what we're gonna do now is talk about the basic electrical behavior of cells. We'll talk about resting potentials of cells, and then the idea of graded potentials versus action potentials, and then a little bit about the synapses in neurons or muscle cells that actually can you know, turn on and off the different potentials. So we are gonna basically now for the rest of today and probably most of Tuesday, talk about electrical properties of cells and the basic things that are gonna be important when we do the nervous system, when we do the muscles and other things. So we're gonna start by doing a thought experiment. So imagine, if you will, a cell that is permeable only to potassium. So I'm just going to have to, I'm just going to put a bunch of potassium channels here. So potassium is free to move in or out through these potassium channels. We're ignoring every, obviously a real cell is more complicated, but this is gonna be useful. You're gonna see, it's gonna be very useful. Um, so this is our starting point. So now we need to think about concentrations of potassium. Again, it was part of our question this in the warm up. Where is potassium more concentrated? Inside the cell. Inside the cell. Exactly. So the concentration of potassium in the cell is actually about 150 millimolar. The concentration of potassium outside the cell is actually about five millimolar. So it is like 30 times as concentrated inside as outside. Um, which way does the potassium want to move due to its diffusion gradient? Thing. Potassium is going to want to leave. And as the potassium leaves, we're going to have a preponderance of positive outside. And it's going to leave us with a relative preponderance of negative inside. So what is happening to the voltage on the cell? Remember, voltage is always inside with respect to outside. So inside has become negative? Uh-huh. So my Vm becomes negative. This is the membrane voltage. 
as it becomes more negative inside with respect to outside, it's becoming a negative membrane um, potential. And again, like I said, voltage and potential are synonyms. So now, now what you got to do is kind of go back when I was first talking about the idea of ions and let me see if I can do this. I did this kind of cool last time. Yeah. All right, so now here is some little ion. Which direction does it want to go just due to its electrical potential? Inside. It wants to go inside. Positive things are want to go where it's more negative. Which way does it want to go due to its diffusion gradient? So, so wait, so. Originally, we have potassium inside, right? Positive charge. So because it starts to accumulating more potassium, now it wants to go outside, right? So the inside becomes negative. So there's two things going on here. Potassium wanted to leave due to the diffusion gradient. It was here. It left due to the diffusion gradient. Now it's on the outside. But as more and more builds up on the outside, we're starting to create a stronger and stronger negative voltage, which is now pulling cations back in. So, right. so in coming. So due to the electrical force that's building up, it's trying to pull the potassium in, but the chemical force, the diffusion gradient is making it wanna leave. So they're in opposition to each other. Do, do you see that? So basically, we're going to start getting a you know, this is due to diffusion. But then we also have coming in due to the negative voltage that's building up in there. So we've got these two different forces that are opposing. And in fact, the more that this that the potassium leaves, the stronger the electrical force is to pull it back in. Right? Does that make sense? So at some point, you're going to hit an equilibrium. You're going to hit some place where the sodium wants to leave due to the diffusion gradient. It's getting pulled back in due to the negative voltage that is pushing it the other way. And at some point, those are going to be exactly balanced and the voltage will be at some stable level. And that happens specifically when you know, the V equilibrium for potassium is going to be minus 90 millivolts. <clears throat> so when enough potassium has left that the voltage in the cell has become minus 90 millivolts, the electrical force pulling the potassium back in exactly balances out the chemical diffusion force that's driving the potassium to leave the cell. So does, does that make sense? No, uh, so when, when is negative 90 millivolt is when is negative inside or? Yeah, it's negative inside. It's, remember we okay. said we're getting a negative voltage because we have more negative left over inside compared to the positive that's accumulating outside the membrane. So and there's actually like a little formula, the Nernst equation that you can use that you just plug in. You plug in what is the concentration inside the cell? What is the concentration outside of the cell? And you can actually just solve it. And it will tell you what is the equilibrium voltage, equilibrium potential 
where this thing will just balance out, where the negative voltage is just strong enough to keep the stuff from leaving due to its diffusion. So we're gonna be building on this. I wanna make sure that everybody kind of understands the basic idea here. There's these two opposing forces. If I am a cation like potassium, I am being driven one by my diffusion gradient, this chemical force, but two, I could also be influenced by the electrical forces due to a voltage across the membrane. And go back in. Exactly. Okay, I see. So because of the diffusion rate of potassium going into the cell becomes, it pushes it out. Well, it's balanced. The diffusion force is pulling it out, but the voltage is pulling it back in. Back in. And at some point they balance. Back and forth, okay. Mm -hmm. At some point we're in the equilibrium. Okay. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is another thought experiment. Imagine, if you will, a cell that is only permeable to sodium. Now, in this case, we know sodium is more concentrated outside the cell. So my concentration of sodium inside the cell is about 15 millimolar. Concentration of sodium outside the cell is about 150 millimolar. So it's like 10 times as much concentration of sodium outside compared to inside. So which way does the sodium want to go due to its diffusion gradient? Inside? Yeah, in this, yeah, this, this time it wants to go inside. So sodium starts building up here as it comes in due to its diffusion gradient. So my membrane voltage is starting to go up, becoming more positive. But now, Again, let me do my little magic with my... Wait, hold on, I had my, it worked before. Let's do it like that. There we go. So I have my little cat eye on my sodium which way does it want to go just due to the chemical force? Due to the diffusion, which way does it want to go? Out of the cell. It wants to go inside. But the more that it goes inside, the more we start getting a positive voltage inside with respect to outside. So if we just think about the electrical force, which way does this little guy want to start going? Outside the cell after. It wants to leave because it's more negative outside, right? Because we're becoming more negative outside compared to the inside. So now we have electrical force pushing it that way, but the diffusion force pushing it in. And we'll hit an equilibrium again, right? At some point, there's going to be a balance the electrical force pulling it out will just balance the electrical, electrical, will just balance the diffusion force pulling it back in and we'll get our V equilibrium, you know, for sodium is gonna be plus 60 millivolts. So when it becomes plus 60 millivolts inside, the diffusion force pulling the sodium in is exactly balanced by the electrical force that is driving it to leave. So does this make sense? 
Uh, just to be clear, so when it reaches 60 millivolts, is when the cell is when it wants to go out? No, it is it, whenever it's positive, there's going to be at least a force moving it out. But when it meets 60 millivolts, that's when the force moving it out is exactly balanced by the diffusion force making it want to come in. That's why it's called an equilibrium, um, like voltage. It's where okay. the electrical force just balances the chemical force, the diffusion okay. force. So, is this all kind of making sense? All right, so now we're going to bring it into the world of real cells. And then we'll take a break. Can we read more about this also in chapter four of our textbook? Um, I forget which chapter, but it's, it's in your book for sure. Okay. Professor, I had one more question. Um, is the equilibrium, is that inside the cell or is that outside the cell? Or is it just? It's across the membrane. Okay. So um, the voltage V sub M is a charge imbalance across the membrane or a charge, I should say charge separation across the membrane. which means that in this case, if it's like that, if it's like this and I have a cation, the cation just due to the voltage is gonna to wanna to move out of the cell because it's more negative on the outside of the membrane compared to the inside. If I had a, um, an anion, would be the opposite. You know, if I had a positive membrane potential, the anion would want to move into the cell where it's more positive side of the membrane. Um, same, th you know, the opposite would be if I had a negative membrane potential. The negative membrane potential would be as if it was charge separation, but it was more positive outside compared to the inside, more negative inside. Now a cation would want to come in due to the electrical potential, or an anion would want to go out due to the electrical potential. So th does that make sense? Yeah, so a positive um, uh, electrical membrane equilibrium means that the um, ions want to move outside the cell, is that right? A cation would. Cations? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I should also mention that the charge separation across the membrane is, is at the membrane. If you look at the thing as a whole, it's still pretty balanced. You know, if you, so it's not like the whole cell has become negative or positive. It's at the membrane that we care about. Um, and in fact, we're going to have, when we have ions entering and leaving, changing the voltage, they are not changing the overall concentrations of ions in the cell very much at all. They're just changing the amount of charge found right at the membrane. Okay. So now let's tie this into the real cell. Who's, who's somebody's got there? Amado. Um, primary permeable to potassium. Not totally, but primarily. So V sub rest for a cell is going to be close to what? 
60. What did we say was the equilibrium voltage for something permeable to potassium, only potassium? Sorry, right. 90. Right. Negative 90. It was negative 90. So the fact is it's not going to be all the way down to negative 90 because there's other things as well. But it's usually around this, the two, the wiggly equal signs means kind of sort of like minus 70 millivolts. So this is a typical neuron or other, we'll see other excitable cells at rest are typically around minus 70 millivolts because it's mainly due to, mainly open to sodium. Um, if excited, you increase the sodium not the sodium, but so when these cells get excited, you open up lots of sodium channels, in which case the voltage V sub M goes up, you know, towards you know plus 60 millivolts. Not all the way, but you know, on their way up towards that. And then after it's not excited anymore, it's resting, it's primarily potassium again. Now it comes back down closer to the potassium. And then you excite it and it goes back up. So this is the reason why I said these aren't real, but they're useful, is a cell at rest is kind of like this guy and is going to have a resting potential, not at, but closer to minus 90, like I said, usually around minus 70. When the cell is getting excited and you open up all these sodium channels, then we are creating a situation that is closer to this one. And now the, all of a sudden the voltage across the membrane is gonna be up, up here, you know, maybe more like plus 50 or something, but you know, close to this, closer to this equilibrium pot potential for just sodium. So understanding excitable cells, it's useful to be able to know that if it's mainly potassium channels open, it's going to be down closer to minus 90. If you then open up a bunch of sodium channels and make it more look like this, the voltage is going to go way up and get positive closer to, to this. So this is going to be at the core of action potentials and things like that. Um, if you, you know, so, or in, in general, if you just open sodium channels, the voltage is going to start going up, open more potassium channels, the voltage will go down. So that, that makes, that makes sense. Yes. Um, I just wanted to make sure I heard this right, but you were saying that the um, voltage is changing pretty much at the membrane, but the concentration within the cell isn't changing that much? Yeah, so that's, that's an important point. It's a little non-intuitive. When I first was learning this stuff, I got confused by this. Um, let me get that picture back. So this is an important point. You know, I was talking about potassium in the cell is around 150 millimolar. Sodium in the cell is about 15 millimolar. And now I'm saying we're opening up potassium channels and opening up sodium channels and this you know, sodium runs in and the voltage goes, you know, if I'm looking at V sub M, the voltage is going way up. And then I'm opening potassium channels and now the voltage is coming back down. So there's ions coming in and out as the voltage is getting swept up and down. But the amount of ions that are entering and leaving are actually pretty insignificant compared to how many are actually in there in total. So these numbers, obviously these numbers are changing a little bit. If ions are, you know, potassium and sodium is coming in and out, they have to be moving a little bit. 
but they're not moving very much. So these don't change much. You know, even as voltage V sub M swings up and down. And then in addition, we constantly have our pumps going. So anything that is changing, we are constantly readjusting and bringing it back to the proper, proper concentrations because we have our active pump that's constantly um, kind of like the little bailing pump in a boat that's, you know, you could think of as the voltage swings up and down, it's like kind of a boat taking on little bits of water, you know, into the, into the hull, but then you've got the little bailing pumps going to make sure that you spit it back out. So, yeah, no, thank you. That's, that's an important point. Thanks for asking that. Um, other questions before we kind of take a break? Can you go back to the last page where you were talking about like the actual cell? Thank you. So again, this resting potential, and it's around there. Different cells can be a little higher or lower. And we're gonna talk about the things that actually, it's, in reality, it's usually a moving target. It's moving up and down as the cell is being, um, being um, jiggled by channels opening and closing due to synaptic activity and things like that. But you know, in general, resting is around minus 70. Um, all right, any other comments, questions? Yeah, unfortunately there, we used to have this cool thing, the interactive physiology, which actually was part of, part of our lab where you could, you know, tweak little sliders on the screen and get to see this in a much more intuitive way but it was all done in Flash. And as of 2021, Flash is no longer supported. So all of the cool like educational tools that we were using that were based on Flash and Shockwave are now obsolete. And nobody has redesigned these particular ones that we used to use yet. So maybe there are things out there, but it is, yeah, I mean, those were those tools were useful because they let you um, actually, you know, kind of adjust little sliders, like change the concentrations inside, move, you know, watch. The more we had ions move in due to diffusion, the more the voltage is starting to go up and the force making them want to leave is going the other way. So there's lots, you know, getting to really think about electrical force versus the diffusion force and how they can start opposing each other and how they're kind of dynamic is the more the things move into diffusion, the more the electrical force builds up opposing it. That's why we hit the equilibrium. Um, so, Right, it's like if you were pushing on something and it's like the farther you push it into the room, the harder it pushes you back. At some point, it's pushing you the same force you're pushing in and you're in, in a lock, you're locked in a standstill. Nobody's moving because you're pushing in as hard as it's pushing you out. So, la la la. So let us take a break. So let's, let's, um, look at receptors binding ligands. So 
what I'm going to talk about right now is going to go into a lot of detail that you don't need to know the details of. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk specifically in one example of like serotonin, you know, one of the classic neurotransmitters binding a particular um, serotonin receptor and talking about like what that actually means. You know, you do need to know the basic ideas, like what I'm talking about. You don't need to know the details. I'm going to talk about how specific at parts of the serotonin molecule are making bonds with particular amino acids that make up the actual receptor in the membrane. Don't worry about that. You don't need to know that kind of detail, but you do need to know the basic details of what is actually going on. What does it mean for a receptor to be binding the ligand and how that causes a conformational shape change of the receptor that causes the G protein to activate. Um, and in this process, it's also going to be a nice review, I think, of some of the chemistry concepts that you are going to be responsible for on your exam. So this is useful to review stuff. It's useful to give you a deeper sense of what binding means. Um, so let's do this. And just to give credit, this was original. This is adapted from a PowerPoint that a friend had made. He's, he used to be a chemist for Pfizer. He was one of the ones who um, actually designed, what's it, um, Elaza, let's try to remember the name of it now, one of the antipsychotic drugs. He would come up with different drugs that affect serotonergic pathways and um, so this is, it's, it's pretty interesting. I think you will find this useful. Um, so let us do this. All right, so this is kind of just starting out, just saying, you know, serotonin is a classical neurotransmitter used by many nerve cells throughout your brain. Um, so, yeah, you know, most people have heard of serotonin. You know, obviously it's just another ligand binding receptors. And you know, even as I've mentioned just a few moments, you know, this morning when we're talking about acetylcholine, I said there's different kinds of acetylcholine receptors, like the nicotinic receptors that were directly gated. I mentioned muscarinic, which we'll talk about in more detail, that bind acetylcholine, but they have different mechanisms. Same thing with serotonin. Serotonin has lots of different receptors. Um, this is gonna focus on a particular one. Um, I should also mention serotonin is also known as 5-hydroxytryptamine. So when we mention serotonin, we often just call it 5-HT. 5-HT, 5-hydroxytryptamine, that just means serotonin, it's synonyms. It's like dog and canine, you know, one is more scientific, one is more casual. So 5-HT is just serotonin. And this is just kind of listing out a variety of different serotonin receptor types. 5-HT1A, 5-HT1B, 1D, 5-HT2A, 2B, blah, blah, blah. Um, this particular talk um, is going to be looking particularly at the 5-HT2A receptors. Um, it's one that's got a star here. Um, these are particularly interesting um, because when you look at the psychedelic drugs, you know, a lot of psychedelic, you know, psychedelic drugs bind all sorts of different receptors. Um, Things like LSD, we call it a very promiscuous ligand because it binds different kinds of serotonin receptors and dopamine receptors and all sorts of stuff. Um, but if you look at all the psychedelic drugs and try to think what is the thing that's common, they all have you know, appreciable binding at this particular subtype of receptor. So people have looked at this one in particular and that's the one that this particular little presentation looks at 
It looks at what's happening when serotonin, aka 5-HT, is binding the 5-HT2A receptor on your neurons in the cell membrane. Um, so in order to really think about this, whoops, now let me clear that and yeah, so it's not unusual. Most receptors have two or more subtypes. To really understand how this works, we have to look at both molecules. We have to look at the molecular structure of the ligand, the serotonin, as well as the molecular structure of the membrane protein that is the receptor. And then we also are going to be looking at all those kinds of interactions that we've been talking about, that kind of those bonding and there's my little spotlight thing. Um, you know, nonpolar interactions, you know, things that are nonpolar tend to cluster together. Hydrogen bonding, when there are local charge imbalances and things make hydrogen bonds. Ionic bonding, where something totally gives up an electron and then you have a plus and a minus that pull together. Um, so all of these are going to be important. You know, that, again, that's why I've been talking about since day one of this class. The chemistry just is at the core of everything. Um, so let us continue here. Quick question. Yeah. Uh, are we in lab now so I can change notes? Are we in lab or lecture still? Um, this is more kind of going deeper into the lecture stuff. Okay, okay. But again, it's not, I wouldn't take... You should, you know, you can take notes in as much as the things that are at the level that you're responsible for. But as I get deeper into this, I'm going to be getting into really pedantic detail that you don't need to know. But this, this stuff you should know. So, yeah, but yeah, no, this is still related more to the lecture stuff. Like I said, this is looking at what exactly is happening when you're binding a ligand at a receptor, and how does that ultimately activate a G protein and start that whole process we've been talking about? This will also give you a better sense of the idea of what are exogenous ligands really doing? Because, um, you know, 5-HT, you know, serotonin is an endogenous ligand. It's made in the body and is binding the receptors as part of your normal functioning of your brain. Whereas, you know, LSD is an exogenous ligand. It's something that you're taking from the outside, but then is going to interact with the receptor and cause changes in your neurochemistry that are going to cause, obviously, tripping and stuff like that. So, so nonpolar, obviously, when you have nonpolar things, they tend to cluster. We, we've talked about that. That's why oil separates from from water. Hydrogen bonding, local charge imbalances, you get things that track hydrogen bonding. Again, it's why water molecules stick to each other. It's why sugar dissolves in water. Ionic bonds, you know, we've talked about it with um, like sodium chloride, but you can also have ionic bonds where one molecule, more complicated molecule, takes on a, an electron and another more complicated molecule gives up an electron. So there's still ionic bonding, but it's not just two ions. It's actually two molecules that are now charged. You know, what do they call them? Polyatomic ions or whatever. So you can have, you know, here this amine part of this thing giving up an electron, this oxygen taking on, and now there's an attraction here, an ionic bond. So Nonpolar stuff, hydrogen bonding, ionic bonding. That should be familiar at this point. That should be like, of course, that is, I'm a pro at that. So here's serotonin. This is the molecular structure for a serotonin molecule. You know, and if you look at it, it has these different sections. It has hydroxyl, which we, uh, we know hydroxyls like to make hydrogen bonds. Remember then when we drew, had the sugar bonding to hydrogen bonding with water, I talked about the hydroxyls on the sugar being things that are particularly polar and make hydrogen bonds. This nitrogen group 
here in this ring is also polar and makes a hydrogen bond. You know, so we have different sections of this molecule that like to make hydrogen bonds. Um, this part of this ring, this is kind of a local nonpolar area. This part here would tend to want to nestle into another nonpolar place. Um, this amino group here likes to make ionic bonds. It likes to grab an electron if possible and then make ionic bonds. So we have this molecule, serotonin. It has a particular shape. So the shape is important as well. So it has a specific shape. And different sections of this geometry like to make different kinds of bonds, hydrogen bonds or nonpolar interactions or ionic bonds. So when you think of this, you know, the key in the lock, you know, normally like a key has different notches and cutouts that fit with the tumblers of your lock. This is kind of the, kind of the, the, the version of a molecule being a key. It has a particular shape and the different parts of this geometry like to make certain kinds of chemical interactions. So the lock that this key fits into is gonna to have to have a shape that receives this and that the different parts of that receiving like to make the appropriate chemical bonds that this thing wants to make. So then when we talk about the lock and the key, that's what the key is. This is like, you know, the key to the lock. It has a particular shape and the different regions of that shape like to make certain kinds of chemical interactions. Um, so, Again, hydroxyl makes hydrogen bonds. This ring is nonpolar. The amino group likes to form ionic bonds. And like I said, that nitrogen can also form ion, I mean, hydrogen bonds. So that's the serotonin part. Obviously now we need to think at, of the receptor in more detail. And again, what kind of a molecule is the receptor? Protein, membrane protein? Protein, again, exactly. It's a membrane protein. So what we're going to do now is go more into detail about proteins, remember about proteins, and then we'll look specifically at the membrane protein that is a receptor. So here we go. So remember, protein chemistry starts with amino acids. And again, there's a bunch, there's 20 naturally occurring amino acids that make up all of the proteins in your body, including your membrane receptors. You know, and they have different um, side chains. We talked about the side, you know, they always have the amine and the carboxyl, but then they all have these different side chains. And some of those side chains are nonpolar. Some are polar and make hydrogen bonds. Some like to make ionic bonds. Remember, we talked about that. Different amino acids like to have different kinds of interactions, and that's going to be important here. So first, you connect them up with peptide bonds. And what do we call this level of structure of just amino acids hooked up in a certain order? Primary? The primary, the primary structure of the protein is just which amino acid is connected to which amino acid. And then what's the secondary structure that we get to? Alpha helices, beta yeah. sheets. Exactly, the alpha helices and the beta pleated sheets. Um, so we're gonna get to that. So before we talk about that, this is actually, this is a, this is a good metaphor here. He's asking for the simile of is a protein kind of like a string of beads? You know, because each amino acid we said is different from each other. There's valines and leucines and cysteines and this and that. And he's like, no, it's not like a string of beans because it's not just like they're different colors. Those side chains are fundamentally different from each other. You know, so he's like, okay, then is it like a charm bracelet? You know, so they're really, they look different. They don't just have different colors. They're like, different. And he's like, no, because 
this doesn't really give you a sense of the functional differences. And so if we are gonna go and think about, oops, matter two. So he's saying it's more like a tool belt, you know, cause here in a tool belt, each of the different parts here have a specific kind of bond that it would like to make. Or, you know, if you have your thing that contains a hammer, this will hold a hammer very nicely, but tape measure is not gonna fit in there at all. It's gonna fall right out. The same thing, a tape measure fits into this tape measure thing really nice, but there's no way it's gonna clip into the hammer thing on this tool belt. This is kind of giving you this sense that each of the side chains on the amino acids have specific kind of interactions that they participate in and others that they don't. This is gonna be important when we look at the protein um, meeting the ligand, remember meeting the serotonin. Some part, parts of the serotonin like to make hydrogen bonds, other like are nonpolar. The same thing, some amino acids like to make nonpolar interactions, some like to make hydrogen bonds. So remembering that a protein is made of amino acids and each amino acid has specific kinds of interactions that it likes to do. So that is gonna be important as we continue on. And then remembering that in addition to that, that there's a three-dimensional structure, just like the serotonin has a, a you know, geometry where different parts of it are not wanting to make different things. The protein is also this big three-dimensional structure. What do we call this? Where you have all the helices and it's all bent up in a big glob. What's, what, what level of structure is this? Tertiary. It's a tertiary structure of a protein. And in this particular one here, you can see that we have these, if I can, Use a different color here. These are representing these alpha helices. Um, each of the colors is representing a different amino acids. And this is actually what a typical receptor, G protein coupled receptor looks like. It has, if, if this is the, it's an intramembrane protein, right? So here's my membrane. My, my, um, I have my phospholipid bilayer. I'm trying to draw the phospholipids here. And it's embedded in that phospholipid bilayer. This is the outside here, outside of the cell. This is a cytoplasm down here, inside the cell. My serotonin is gonna be coming in from the top. It's gonna to see the top of this. The G protein is gonna be down here where in, you know, in the cytoplasm side. So we're gonna meet our G protein sitting down here, which is gonna activate the rest of our second messenger pathway. Up here is gonna be that little place where the serotonin comes in and binds, you know, so and these helices are kind of going up and down through the membrane. We call them the transmembrane helices. There's seven of them. So these are gonna be, these are gonna be just the structure of this receptor. It's got these helices that go down and back up and down and back up and down and back up. Um, so, Remembering an alpha helix is every third amino acid makes a hydrogen bond to the one in the spiral above it. So it stabilizes that helix. You know, and this is just kind of showing a more um, um, kind of cartoon level of, this is the alpha helix coming down. There's a loop on the cytoplasm side. There's an alpha helix coming back up. There's stuff on the outside of the cell. 
You know, so this is a picture of what a classic receptor, G protein coupled receptor looks like. You know, and like I mentioned, and I'll mention again, this side here is where the ligand is going to kind of come in and interact with all of the amino acids over here. But when that happens, just to give you kind of like spoiler alert, as your ligand, in this case, the serotonin binds here, it's gonna yank on things, it's gonna change the shape here. And it's, that's what's gonna be the activation of the G protein. So again, the G protein is waiting here. As my ligand comes in and fits in, it's going to adjust, it's gonna make a change of the relative angles of these helices. As that happens, it's gonna catalyze the activation of the G protein, which is gonna start that whole second messenger pathway. So let's look at this in more detail now. Oops. So again, receptor sitting here, G protein is sitting here waiting to get activated. You know, let's look at what happens. So this is kind of the view from above. Um, what if I can, my annotate, do I have like spotlight? Okay, I can show like in here, this is, again, look, if you're floating here and you're coming down to the cell membrane, what you're actually going to see is like, whoa, there's like this playground full of amino acids. And again, each of these amino acids has those side chains. Some of them are going to want to make hydrogen bonds. Some are going to want to be nonpolar. Some are going to make ionic bonds. And they're all held in a particular shape based on the folding of this protein. So a serotonin receptor is going to have a place. Okay, for... I found this on the web for hey, serotonin receptor is going to have. Check oh, it out. I actually have the thing like turned off so you're not supposed to hear it and it's still like, I apologize, I apologize. Um, all right, serotonin receptors gonna have a perfect pocket for the serotonin molecule to land in. And so we're gonna look at that in detail now. So here, this purple thing is the serotonin molecule. <coughs> this green is showing the place where the serotonin molecule is kind of docking, where it's gonna land. I'm gonna talk about Details that you do not, don't worry about the specific details about which amino acid binds onto which part of the serotonin molecule. That's not the point of doing this. The point is just to get a sense of how it works. So don't, don't, don't take notes about which part of the serotonin binds which residue on the, on the protein. Okay, just a reminder. There's the hydroxyl that likes to make hydrogen bonds. The nitrogen likes to make hydrogen bonds. This ring is nonpolar. The amino group likes to make um, ionic bonds. So now we're set. We've got a molecule that has a particular shape and likes to make certain kinds of bonds. And now it's landing down into this big complicated protein, which also has a specific shape and different side chains that like to make different kinds of bonds. And here we go. All right, on the third transmembrane helix, the amine group of the serotonin forms a strong ionic bond with an aspartic acid and also a hydrogen bond with an adjacent serine. So here we have the amino group on the, on the serotonin and we have a hydrogen bond and ionic bond that are forming in here. So, so that is part of what we, when we call binding. 
This is what we mean by binding. This thing is settling into its pocket and the parts of the ligand are making specific bonds with the receptor and starting to kind of get held in there. Now on Tron's membrane, helix five, a serine forms a hydrogen bond with the nitrogen on the indole ring. So here we have right down here, this is the nitrogen in that ring. And here it's making a hydrogen bond here with this serine. So here we have an attraction. So we have an attraction here, a hydrogen bond here. We have a hydrogen bond and ionic bond with the amino group over here. So you can kind of see different parts of this membrane protein, which on these helices are making these attractions with the different parts of the serotonin molecule. You know, on transmembrane helix six, two phenylalanines and a tryptophan make a local hydrophobic pocket, which the nonpolar parts of the ring is gonna settle into. So now we have this nonpolar part settling into this place here on inside the pocket that's nonpolar. So again, it's like kind of the, you know, a hand fitting into a glove, right? It has the right shape and it has the right chemical properties to just want to settle in there. So as that happens, it settles in there and it kind of holds and it pulls. And as it gets and fits in just right, it actually yanks on those helices and changes the angles of them with respect to each other. So these helices shift a little bit. So on, as you have the serotonin attach in here on the external side, on the intracellular side, they shift their shape and that's what activates the G protein and starts the whole process, starts the whole signal transduction pathway. So is that, does that make sense? When we talk about binding, that's what we're talking about. This little ligand gets in the pocket, is just the right shape, makes just the right bonds to fit, fit in there, grab on and pull. And as it does that, it changes the shape of this in just the right way in order to activate the G protein and start the G protein mediated pathway. So is, is, does, is that, does, that, does that make sense? And this binding is temporary, right? Just after a while, the serotonin's got its jiggling and it lets go and it floats out. And maybe it floats back in and goes in there for a while again, then it floats out. You know, depending on affinity is how much does it hold on before it gets kicked out, right? High affinity, it holds on for longer before it gets kicked out. Um, low affinity, it gets in there, but then it's out, it gets kicked out easier. So are there any questions what we mean by binding here? Okay, so now what this is, this presentation goes on into exogenous ligands. Um, in particular, it's gonna look at psilocybin, like magic mushrooms, which have their effect because they bind at the same receptor. So, Again, so like I said, if you have serotonin binds on the outside, whoops, changes the shape of things enough that it activates the G protein underneath. The G protein is activated, you know, talks to adenyl cyclase, makes cyclic AMP, starts all that stuff we've been talking about. So this would be like the normal way it goes. Let's look at psilocin. So psilo psilocybin is the, is the main... Um, active ingredient of magic mushrooms, psychedelic mushrooms. Um, once it gets into your digestive tract, it's turned into psilocin. So psilocin is basically the active ingredient of magic mushrooms. And it's worth taking a look at what it looks like. You know, it looks awfully like serotonin, right? got the same basic structure. It's got the same indole ring and carbon ring. Um, it's got some changes. It's got like the hydroxyl is shifted 
by a um, by his position on the ring. So it's not exactly the same. Also, um, it's got these methyl groups here. So there's it's a little larger here. Instead of just like this little amino group, it's got the nitrogen with two methyl groups hanging off it. So it's not exactly the same, but it's awfully close. It's not gonna be that stretch of an imagination to think that a lock where serotonin is the key, psilocybin is likely to get in there and do something, right? It looks really similar. It's the same basic shape, the different parts of the shape. Um, tend to do the same kind of chemical interactions. So when we think about exogenous ligands, that's what we're thinking about. You know, it's gonna be something that can mimic the endogenous ligand. You know, it's this thing here is close enough that when it gets into the receptor, it's gonna probably be able to do a lot of the same kind of binding that the endogenous ligand can do. So, is, is that making sense? When we, when we and this would be whether it's albuterol inhalers mimicking what adrenaline looks like, or whether we're talking about psilocybin and LSD mimicking what serotonin looks like. You know, it's something that mimics, or caffeine. Caffeine is mimicking adenosine and adenosine receptors. You know, most of these endogenous ligands work by looking, they're close enough and they can get into the receptor and do so, they can bind and do something. So let's continue on. You know, and so basically here, he's just going into the details of how psilocybin or psilocin in this case, um, binds into the receptor. And it's basically similar, but it's not exactly because, you know, the um, hydrogen bonds on that hydroxyl are not as strong because it's shifted over a space on, on the ring. Um, the, you know, this, you know, again, I'm not going to go into the detail, but the basic idea is psilocybin, or in this case, psilocin, I should say, and serotonin are close enough that they get into the, into the um, receptor and they activate it. Um, they don't activate it as strongly. You know, this is what we would call a partial agonist. They get in there and they turn it on, but they don't turn it on as strongly, but they're definitely turning it on and they're causing, you know, second messenger pathways to activate, which ultimately is going to cause all of the effects of, you know, tripping on mushrooms. You know, you're turning on all of these serotonin um, receptors all over your brain and your neurons and creating obviously all sorts of effects in your perception and things like that. So, does that, does that, does that make sense? Is that kind of clear? Right, and again, like other drugs, a lot of drugs work, you know, with the same basic game plan. Again, like, in fact, let me try to find, let me see if I can do this quickly. If I can do it quickly, I will show you. I'm gonna go to Google Images. Caffeine. Here, I'm gonna, I can just share this with you. Her screen in mean, Google Images. I'm um, caffeine and adenosine. Here we go. Uh, view image. You know, caffeine is a molecule, obviously, that you know affects your nervous system. It perks you up. Um, adenosine is the endogenous ligand that we are actually concerned with here. So adenosine, which is a nucleotide, but it's, or, you know, a nucleotide base, I guess, is a neurotransmitter in this case. 
right? Just like, like I, you know, I mentioned things can be many different things, like, like a pencil. A pencil can be a writing instrument if you're in class taking notes. It can be a thing for getting wax out of your ears if you're doing personal grooming. It can be a murder weapon if you poke somebody full of holes with it, right? You know, uh, this, this is just a thing. What exactly it's doing depends on the context. You know, in your brain, adenosine is actually playing a role of a neurotransmitter. You know, as it builds up, it binds adenosine receptors and that actually starts activating these pathways that make you sleepy. You know, caffeine, if you take a look at the shape of this thing, it's like, oh my God, it's not that shocking that it's gonna be able to fit into the pocket. It's got a lot of the same kind of shape in there. It gets into the pocket, but it's also pretty different. It gets into the pocket and it blocks the pocket. So then the actual adenosine tries to get into the receptor, but it can't. And since adenosine normally makes you tired as it binds the receptor, if you are blocking the receptor with caffeine, then you're feeling a little more awake. But it's the same basic idea. It's an exogenous ligand that has a shape similar enough to the endogenous ligand that it gets into the receptor and binds. In this case, we're talking about a an antagonist instead of an agonist. Um, so any comments, questions? I do, it is important that you understand what we mean by binding, why it makes sense that one thing might be an agonist or antagonist or be a, a likely candidate. You know, if it has a similar structure, chemical structure it makes more sense that it's gonna be able to fool the receptor and bind it, right? Um, this might be a dumb question, but like, is there, is it just a coincidence that there's stuff in plants that kind of mimics stuff in our bodies? Or is there like a reason for that? Does that make sense? So there's a mix. I say lots, there's definitely coevolution. Um, some of the stuff affects mammalian um, systems uh, in order to, you know, Sometimes it's aversive, so the plant, you know, you try to eat the plant and it's unpleasant or it's poisonous, so it keeps people from eating it. Um, some of the stuff, it might be random or who knows, you know, some people have, you know, probably, you know, like marijuana plants are cultivated by humans and the ones that get you have more THC and are more likely to get you high are gonna be the ones that are gonna be propagated and are more like, you know, so there is definitely a thing where, you know, the plant gets propagated and humans get stoned and everybody's happy, right? So there, it's not random that, you know, more of these plants have been selected in their relationship with humans. Um, other things that are kind of wild, like capsaicin, the, the um, thing in peppers that burns your mouth. You know, that is, it's an interesting story. The, um, this will just be a quick aside. It's just, it's, it's, I can think I can do this fast. Um, birds and, anim, and mammals are very different in their re reaction to capsaicin. Um, so if, you got a chili pepper, you know, and it's got seeds in it, right? The chili pepper is just a, it's, it's the fruit of a pepper plant, right? And the whole point is the chili plant is making these chilies to have seeds that are gonna grow into new little plants someplace else. And hopefully, you know, plants are a little, have a, a problem, plants are rooted in place. Right, humans, you can mate and you have a kid and your kid moves out of the house. But if you're a plant and your baby drops right near you and they're all, you know, all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, they're, this is a disaster. They're all, you don't want your seeds dropping and growing right at the, your feet. 
and everybody's anchored to the same spot. So you want your kids to be far away, but you want to give them a good chance, you know, to get started and get have a good life. So it turns out that birds will eat the peppers. And it turns out birds do not have the receptors for capsaicin. So the birds do not experience heat or anything aversive. And it also turns out the birds have a short digestive tract. So the birds eat the pepper. By the time the bird poops, the seeds are still viable. Hold on one second, I apologize. So the seeds are viable. They're in a bit of manure, you know, the bird poop. So they've got nice nutrients to grow and they're dropping far away from mama plant. So we got new plants growing and it's all great. The problem with mammals, they have a much longer involved digestive tract if this guy eats this, by the time it comes out as poop, the little fruit has been so thoroughly digested that the seeds are no longer viable. So that means, you know, the plant is like, oh, my babies have all like, they're, 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 all, they're, not, they're all dead, they're not gonna grow. So, but it turns out that these have evolved to be really unpleasant for this guy to eat. So this guy avoids them and doesn't eat them. But the birds, which are kind of this ideal vector for spreading the seeds and dropping them far away in a little pile of fertilizer, don't taste the capsaicin at all. So that's like an example of this kind of coevolution of, you know, plants that make chemicals that interact or not with receptors in other other animals. So just kind of putting that out there. It's, it's kind of, yeah, so there's a lot of coevolution that way. Um, okay. Yeah, this will not be on your test. And there's nothing about like, um, but, but it is, it is really cool. I was going to ask if it could be an extra credit question. <laughs> um, yeah, no, there's one of the things that is, you know, the human body is really cool and we're obviously doing human physiology, but doing like comparative physiology is actually really cool. We don't, we don't do much of it because we don't have time, but lots of different animals do things similar or different depending on their body's needs. And it's really kind of cool to see how different animals are similar or different. Like bird lungs are way different than ours and way more efficient and cool. Um, you know, kidneys in different animals are very different from ours if they need to. You know, if you live in the desert, your kidneys have to be great at conserving water. If you are like some like nutria or something that spends all your time in living in a river, you don't need to worry about dehydrating because you just live in the water. Or if you're in different fish, some fish live in salt water versus fish live in fresh water. You can imagine your osmotic like pressures are really different and the way you've evolved to survive are gonna be pretty different. 